Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, CRA in Rural America. My name is Shantaria Charleston, HACS Training Manager, and I will be the moderator for today's call. If you have not already done so, please ensure that you have access to both the audio and video portion of the webinar. To access the PowerPoint, please use the link on your meeting confirmation email. Again, all participants are in listen-only mode, which means your line is muted. However, we are very interested in your questions and feedback, so today during the webinar, to submit a question, please use the Q&A box that will appear on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and the PowerPoint will be available on HACS website www.ruralhome.org shortly following the webinar. And so there's a couple of people still joining us, but right now I see a lot of familiar names. But for those of you that are not familiar with the Housing Assistance Council, HACC is a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. that assists local organizations with building affordable homes in rural America. With the mission to improve housing conditions for the rural poor, HACC places a special emphasis on striving to serve the poorest of the poor in the most rural places. HACC emphasizes local solutions, empowerment of the poor, reduced dependence, and self-help strategies. HACC assists with the development of both single and multifamily homes and promotes home ownership for working low-income rural families through a self-help sweat equity construction method. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about HACC's products or services, HACC has an office near you. If you have questions or you require assistance, please contact your nearest HACC office. The contact information along with the addresses are currently being displayed on the screen. Also, please mark your calendar and join us for the upcoming webinars as well as place-based events. We have a couple of webinars coming up. We have CRA Part 2, which Keith will outline uh, later on in the call, as well as CRA Part 3. We have three place-based uh, training events that are coming up. We've got our advanced financial management for nonprofits taking place in North Charleston, South Carolina, as well as our Section 502 packaging training uh, for nonprofit developers uh, over March 8th and 9th, as well as March 8th through 10th. And then also join us for our Serving America's Aging Veterans Symposium that's taking place on May 18th in Washington, D.C. So again, I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar, CRA in Rural America. At this point, I will introduce and welcome our speakers for today, Lance George and Keith Wiley. Lance is HACS Director of Research and Information, where he's responsible for overseeing research, information, public relations, and communication activities that serve to further the knowledge of rural housing policy, issues, and trends. Before coming to HACC, Lance worked for Frontier Housing, a, a nonprofit organization that builds affordable housing for low-income families in Appalachian, East Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky. Our second speaker is Keith Wiley. Keith is a research associate for the Housing Assistance Council and works extensively with many data sets in an effort to better understand where, when, and how development patterns occur. As part of those efforts, Keith authored a recent article in the Journal of Housing Policy Debate entitled The Role of the CDBG Program in Rural America and has written several research reports analyzing rural lending activities. So at this point, I would like to turn the webinar over to Lance. Thank you, Shantaria, and thank you everyone for joining us today on this call. Um, I wanted to make just a couple of preliminary remarks before Keith got into the heart of the <clears throat> of the presentation here today. Um, we we generally um, I think there's a perception or oftentimes a misperception that CRA is not relevant in rural America given some of the parameters of the large um, components of the program. It is a relatively complicated um, rural or initiative. Um, but qu quite frankly, HACC took a more critical look at that. We were, might have been guilty ourselves of thinking it, it wasn't as relevant as it may be. 
Um, so over the past couple of years, we've taken a more critical look at the Community Reinvestment Act and its intersection in rural communities and more specifically kind of in mortgage access and mortgage finance and housing. Um, so as Shantari noted, we have kind of a three-part series here, and today's really the introduction. It's more introductory. We understand that CRA can be quite complicated, but we wanted to specifically look at CRA in, in rural communities, the, kind of a general context or a general overview. Um, I wanted to provide a couple of preliminary remarks in relation to, to Keith's um, presentation today. Um, sometimes these might be the caveats or um, uh, disclaimers. I, I maybe feel like I'm the in those pharmaceutical commercials, the person that gives all the side effects of the medication, but we did think it was uh, important to point out a couple of elements of today's presentation. First, it is very broad. It's general. This is the first in the three-part series, so we wanted to introduce the topic. Um, Secondly, we are primarily focusing in this component of the project on mortgage access and finance. We understand that CRA is more wide encompassing than that and touches many other areas, but we're a housing organization and quite frankly a lot of the work with this particular element focused specifically on mortgage access and finance. And then secondly, I would say um, one of the operative words in the Community Reinvestment Act is, quite frankly, community. So this is a large national, oftentimes the term is used, the 30,000-foot level. Um, and I'm not trying to discredit our work at all. Actually, we think this is, um, you know, it's, it's somewhat groundbreaking or we're the only people, we think we've done some of the only work on this at a large national scale looking at CRA in rural communities. But at the same time, um, I think one of our findings is that CRA is probably most effective at the community level. So we're looking at it from a large national perspective, but we really want you to think about these elements in your particular community because we think oftentimes that's where CRA is most impacted. Um, so with those remarks, I'd just like to turn over the presentation to Hack Senior Research Associate Keith Wiley. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Lance. I appreciate it and uh, hope everybody's having a good afternoon. And uh, before I, I get into this, I just want to uh, turn it over to Sean Terrier for a, a, a br brief poll question here to essentially judge the people's familiarity with the CRA. All right, so very quickly we want to just get everyone to participate in the poll that's being displayed on your screen. And it's just a really simple question as Keith has outlined. How familiar are you with CRA? And so we'll give a couple more minutes. Um, Looks like about 35% of us, or 36%, are moderately familiar. Another 29% are somewhat familiar. And let's see, we have um, maybe about 20% that are extremely familiar. And then just about a little bit over 12% that are not familiar at all. So it looks like we have um, a range of familiarity on the phone today, Keith. So we will go ahead and close out the poll at this point. And I will turn it back over to you, Keith. Okay, thanks, Shantara. Yeah, it looks like uh, for some, a lot of you people, this, a lot of the, the participants, it'll be a lot of this will be uh, information I already know. But also, I'm going to put it in a rural context. And the presentation, Jenny, I'm just going to follow. I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about the, the banking industry and just look at the decline in lenders. And then I'm going to touch just provide a real brief overview of the CRA. And then and talk a little bit about how it touches rural communities. Now, this first uh, this uh, first slide here just shows the uh, FDIC insured uh, lenders uh, from 1985 to 2014, and you can follow the red line up up top. You can see there's about 18,000 uh, banks and savings and thrifts in 18 or 1985, and there's only about 6,500 now. Uh, it's a pretty big decline, and over that time, a lot of it. There's been multiple reasons why the number of chartered uh, banks has declined, but a lot of it has been in the small asset lenders. Uh, so it's been a pr pretty significant. Uh, and at the same time this has occurred, there's also been a concentration of assets. So in like 1970, there was about, in the top 10 banks, I think they had uh, like 20% of all assets. But today they have over 50%. And so just put this in context of the, the decline, and is at the same time you're losing small asset lenders, you also see a concentration among those with a lot of assets. And it's, interestingly enough, this is, it's proportional to all, so it's not all rural, it's similar proportion as a rural, suburban, or urban headquartered institution. So there's been a significant drop in the number of, of uh, banks. Now the next slide, I just 
wanted to show the, the current situation uh, in uh, lenders. And you see about the blue bar actually shows the uh, percent of all lenders. And you can see that most of them, and it's based on their headquarters. So you can see 53% of uh, FDIC insured lenders are uh, in rural areas. So it's a majority, but then the orange bar shows their assets. And you can see they only hold about 6% of all assets. So while there's a majority of banks are in rural areas, which a lot of people maybe didn't know, uh, they are very small. And why I, before I move on to the CRA, I just want to say why I think those things are important is that uh, at the same time we see a decline in banks, it can be really important for rural communities, uh, particularly uh, if there's fewer options to begin with and we see acquisitions and mergers, it may take a local bank uh, out of an area and maybe not the headquarters this is in a suburban or urban community. And also at the same time we see a decline in number of lenders that are covering larger areas. The CRA can be more important, right? Because if you're covering more areas, it may be important to have oversight to make sure everybody's getting access. And that leads me into the CRA. And this is just a brief overview. As Lance was saying, it's very complicated. There's many different parts to it. But just in brief, and I'm sure a lot of you know a little bit of this, but it was enacted in 1977, and it was essentially a response to disinvestment and discriminatory lending practices, such as redlining, uh, and this often is thought of as urban blight. And I think this is probably part of the reason why it's associated with urban areas, too. Uh, and essentially, the CRA says that lenders have an obligation to serve all parts of their service area in a safe and sound manner. And what they're recognizing is if you take deposits in a location, essentially it says you need to actually provide credit access to that community. And it applies to FDIC depository insured institutions. It does not apply to like credit unions or independent mortgage companies. And the uh, regulators that, uh, the, that administer the CRA are the OCC, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC. And they basically periodically assess whether or not the lenders are meeting their obligations. So in a sense, it's kind of straightforward. The CRA says that you have to serve all parts of your community, and then the regulators come in and periodically evaluate lenders to make sure they do that. And these periodic evaluations are called CRA examinations, and they generally occur every two to five years. And they generally, to various degrees, explore retail lending, services, and community investment or development activity. There are three primary types of examinations. There is a large bank exam, an intermediate small exam, and a small bank exam. And essentially, they follow the size of the lender. So the large bank exams for large asset lenders over like it's one means 1.3 billion now in assets. And those that exam, they, they test for retail lending, services, and community investments. The intermediate is just below that, down to 300 million in assets. And that test has that exam has two tests: the retail lending, and the uh, a combination of the services and community investment test. And then you have the small bank exam, and they just look at retail lending. And also the nature of the test, the large bank exams are more common. They come every two to three years normally. And the intermediate small bank exams are every three to five years. And I just want to include this slide that just gives a general makeup each year for the last three years what the exams were like. About 62% were small bank exams. About 27% were intermediate small bank exams, and 10% were large bank. And if you notice that little yellow sliver there, that shows that there are other, other types that the banks can use, but it's real small. So it's overwhelmingly most banks have a large bank, small bank, or intermediate small bank exam. And next, a key component of it is the, is the, of the CRA is the assessment area. So essentially what they're doing is we're making sure banks serve the, their service area, and the assessment area represents that service area. It's where lenders operate a deposit-taking office and or an area where they do a substantial amount of their lending activity. <clears throat> and generally what it is is, say, a bank will have the Johnstown Metropolitan Area. Maybe they might have that as an assessment area, a large bank. And it's the, they have a large area, but then they winnow it down using the census tract geography to only places where they actually have branches or do operations. And when they do that, they cannot exclude areas, and it has to be contiguous, the assessment area. And a large bank can have multiple areas, like a Wells Fargo would be maybe Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh and different counties and communities and cities all over. And a part of this, and I think it's significant, especially as it relates to rural areas, is activity regulators look for and they highly value uh, like community investment and development activity that occurs in certain areas. You get like CRA points for that. This would be more for, like for large banks. 
and originally it was just low and moderate income census tracts. And those are census tracts that have incomes of 80% or lower of the area median. And then the other two areas were added to increase, hopefully increase rural development. The economically distressed outside metropolitan area census tracts group and the underserved outside metropolitan area census tracts. And these are essentially areas they were concerned and they meet other criteria. The economically distressed one meets criteria of it. It's either 20% poverty or more, one and a half times the national unemployment rate, or it reaches a certain population loss. And the underserved is essentially remote areas using RUCA codes. And include this map just to show. Uh, I, I see there's, I hope it's a little, it's confusing, but I got the, the color scheme. The, the red is the low and moderate income census tracts. The blue is the distressed census tracts. And the uh, purple are the underserved census tracts. And the reason why I like to include it is it shows there's large rural coverage. And you can actually see many of these tracts are in like central Appalachia, the southeast United States, the lower Mississippi Delta, and in the plains. And about 41% of the, the rural population is in one of these tracts. So it is a significant area. And actually, 46% of the urban tracts are in, populations are in that area. That's one of those areas. And now when you, you, they define their assessment area and they perform their evaluation at the end, regulators award a final overall grade. So you can get an outstanding, satisfactory, a needs to improve, or a substantial noncompliance. Now, essentially, an incentive to get a good grade is that regulators, when a bank applies for something, such as they want to acquire another bank or even open an office, they can look back in your rating. And if you have a poor rating, which would be like a needs to improve or a substantial noncompliance, it could be used against you. So you probably don't want one of those ratings. So that's an incentive. And also another incentive, you see, if you just type in outstanding CRA ratings, a lender is oftentimes proud, and they should be, that they get a good rating. So they'll also use that too. So those are two incentives. But the next slide just gives a general breakdown each of the last three years of the ratings. And we see about 98% of banks actually pass to get a satisfactory and outstanding. A small, about 2%, got a needs to improve or substantial noncompliance. And this is pretty much the same regardless of geography. The only difference is if you're a small bank, you're more inclined a little bit to get a satisfactory rating. And if you're a large bank, you're a little more inclined to get an outstanding rating. So most banks do get a, a passing rating. Now, I want to take from that and, and see how that maybe relates to rural areas. Because still, you know, even though people may think well it's primarily urban it was started for maybe urban blight and it might not be but we we wanted to look and say yeah we think in fact because it covers all depository institutions it would cover rural lending and so this next next slide here is what we did was we took the uh, uh, mortgage lending data and this is home purchase loans from the HMDA and we we graphed the percentage of them of rural home purchase loans that were covered by a CRA regulated lender and you can see the orange line is the CRA regulated lender from 2005 to 2014 lenders. And the blue line is the national rate. And always a majority of home purchase loans were done by CRA regulated lenders or affiliates. Last year it was 57%, but many years it was over 70%. And this, this shows that there's a significant amount of that activity that is done by lenders who are regulated by the CRA. Now, this does fluctuate and it does change, but over this 10-year period, it was always a majority of the home purchase originations, which is interesting. In the next slide, I just wanted to plot just to give people an understanding of the banks based on their location, and it also ties in with the next then one immediately after this. Rural and small town areas, about 80% of the banks get a small bank exam, and it's in blue. And you see it gets smaller as you go to urban areas, and it gets down to in urban areas, and about 43% of the banks are, get the small bank exam. But it's the opposite when you look at the large bank exams. So most large bank exams, m many of the urban lenders do take, get a large bank exam. And this also follows with the previous slides we showed back with the banking assets. That, in fact, most large banks are located in suburban and urban areas. And this is sometimes people get concerned when there's bank acquisitions that it can take a small local link with a bank away. And then now that it's in suburban and urban communities, there's been a little bit of research on this, it may be more difficult to access credit. Now the next slide was we wanted to look at those HMDA loans, the rural mortgage home purchase loans, and see who made them. And you can see a majority of those loans are actually made by large banks. About two-thirds of them were each of these three years in rural areas. And so 
this goes, just goes to show you just because a majority of the small banks loan lenders that were located in rural communities were small banks, they did not make up a majority of the loans. Large banks actually did, and this is common in, in mortgage lending, but just it's, it's an interesting point. Now, I also wanted to look a little bit here at the assessment areas, because that's very critical, right? I mean, the assessment areas is where they're being evaluated on, and if they don't have rural coverage, lenders might not serve them. So if you look, the blue, the blue bar actually gives you the percent of lenders, and they're based on asset size, small bank, intermediate, large, and in total. And it shows the percent in their assessment area. We estimated it as any place where a branch is located. If you had a county, then we call that your assessment area. And we estimated that 85% overall, and for every bank category, over 80% of lenders actually had some rural population in their assessment area. So banks do serve rural communities pretty much regardless of their size to some degree. And then I took it a little further and I took the orange bar. And if you look at it, that's the, if the rural assessment area population was 25% or more. And if you see in the small banks, a lot of them, that is the case. And that makes sense because they're rural headquartered. But if you look at large banks, most of them are not, do not have a quarter or more of their assessment area population rural. And I think that's real important because as they do more lending, that can be a challenge. If a rural, the percent of their service area rural population is smaller, it may be harder to find, be more difficult to serve certain like home community development or investment loans. And then at the bottom, I have a, and a little, it's like a little gray bar. I have the percentage of, the, of, the, of their assessment area that was actually uh, rural distressed and underserved population is 25% or more. Now this would be really interesting. You wouldn't expect many banks to have 25% or more of their assessment area being distressed or underserved, but in some small banks that is the case. But what's interesting is if you look at large banks, it's very, very few do. And that's also a point there's oftentimes talked about trying to increase the number of community development and investment lending done by larger banks. And sometimes if it makes up a small portion, it may be a little harder to do that of their overall assessment area. Now, I got one more slide, and what we did was we took the actual loans and we plotted them, we put them in the assessment area, and what we wanted to do is just to see how many of the rural loans actually were covered by their assessment areas. And really, the, the white bar on the left, that means that about, and I should have put the numbers on here, but about 40% of lenders had less than half their rural loans occur in their assessment area. So that means that if they made like 10 loans, more than five of the rural loans were not in the assessment area. So I just include this to show sometimes the assessment area maybe doesn't fully capture rural lending. Maybe that's because rural lending is a real small part, or maybe it's because uh, the rural assessment area population is really small, or there are just not as many branches there. But it's just another way to look at it. Now, to, to perform this report, basically, I, these resources, and I think it's important to people know and use them, is the, available as the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council is one that you can go there and it's like almost like a clearinghouse for information. You can go there and you can do a search for the, your local bank and find the rating. Uh, you can go there and you can, it'll link you directly to the examination schedule because every time there's a CRA exam, they have posted a quarter, I think a quarter ahead of time. You can go there and you can directly link. You can find out about it. You can, when you go there and you find out about the rating, you can click and it'll take you directly to the regular website and you can get a PDF of the exam. So if you want to know why your bank got the rating it got, there'll be a report at the end and a PDF will explain that. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, I think is also another good source because it provides HMDA data. And the HMDA data is important. Now, it's an unperfect data source, especially for rural areas, because it does exclude some small lenders from filing. But it's a good way to measure lender activity if you want to see how the lender activity for your local bank is in your local area. And the CFPB has some special capabilities maybe to search by bank. And the last three I have are the regulators themselves. The Office of Comptroller of Currency website, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC. And these are great resources because, you know, you can go there and get all that CRA information about the ratings, uh, their upcoming lists, and also things like the FDIC, you can find out where all the bank branches are and you can download that data. 
And a, a neat thing I think about, the, the interesting thing about this is you can use the data if you want to look to see how your lender's doing, or maybe you would have a project or something, and you wanted to see if maybe it was in a lender's assessment, or you wanted to or look into what well, you think it might be. It might be helpful to have this information. Now, this data is in a report form, a lot of it is, and which is more detailed. This is a real quick and cursory uh, discussion about it. Uh, but we have it in a report on our website. It's called CRA in Rural America, where we talk about a lot of these issues. We talk about the, the banking decline in the industry, and then we also talk about the lenders and their rural activity, especially, as Lance had said originally, the mortgage lending activity. And so the URL there below actually provides that information. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's a good resource because uh, very rarely do you hear about the CRA in rural areas. As a matter of fact, I don't think many people think most of the lenders that are actually under the CRA regulation, regulation or rural headquartered lenders or that as the assessment data shows that about 80% of lenders have some rural population in what's likely their assessment area. And just as a discussion, we're going to have two more of these. This was just a preliminary and introduction. And the 16th, we're going to have a webinar where we talk about successful projects. Um, we're going to highlight a, a project or two. We're going to have an involved party talk about it or a bank at earn credit just to explain what, how it works, how it happens. You don't hear much of this. And I think it would be helpful just to talk about a project through and see how it worked and what role the CRA had played in that project. And then the 13th, we have another webinar where we're going to look more closely at outstanding lenders, and then we're going to discuss efforts to increase CRA-related CRA activity in rural areas, uh, because there's often, like the OCC has talked about it, Mr. Curry, about efforts to encourage uh, more lending through the CRA in rural areas. So we think that's important as well. And now I'm just going to turn it over to Shantaria for, for a, a poll question here at the end uh, on, on, on your interest in the CRA. All right. Thanks, Keith. And so um, on your screen now is a poll that is just asking how likely um, are you likely to continue your interest in CRA? And so if you will just go ahead and please um, respond to that poll, please. Well, <laughs> looks like we've got um, about 100% reporting in as yes, they are likely to continue their interest in CRA. Um, we've got maybe 60% of the group um, that's responded in, and let's see, we'll give everyone another second or two, but it looks like most, for the most part, everyone, you know, is pretty much likely to continue their interest. So we're going to go ahead and end that poll and close it out. Um, at this point, Keith, do we want to... Um, move to questions because we have a few questions that have come in and we want to go ahead and answer the questions that have come in but for those of you out there that have burning questions and have not yet entered them into the Q&A now is a good opportunity to do that so Keith I'm going to go ahead and start you out with the questions that we do have here on hand and so the first question is does sure. the list of distressed and underserved census tracts change from year to year Uh, yes, it does. It, it changes and it's, it's updated and you can go to the uh, FFIEC website uh, to get that information. Uh, they have a list and, and, uh, and it's, it, that's really, uh, again, it's a useful website. You can go there and you can get the list and you can, uh, and, uh, you can, you can find them and you can, uh, especially if you're looking about your community and you want to know if there are any in your community and maybe you have a project in one of those areas. Yes, it does. And, uh, and they also change the uh, low and moderate income census tracts to that designation changes. Uh, but the, the distressed and underserved ones is particularly useful, too, because it's easier to get. It's in an Excel format. And it also explains the rationale for how it was uh, determined. OK, thank you, Keith. Um, the next question we have um, says, do the rural lenders service their mortgages, or do they sell them? on the secondary mortgage market? Well, some of those loans would be would be sold. We haven't done, we've done a little bit of analysis of that, like the general, uh, sold, the, the amount of loans that are purchased or sold. We looked a little bit into the GSEs and some of the work, there's some, some work here done on the duty to serve, uh, the webinar we had done recently. But yeah, I haven't looked as closely as that as we should. I'm sure a lot of those loans are sold, though. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a high proportion 
high percentage. I can't think right now, but yeah, that's definitely something that 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 we can and we want to look at. Uh, and we've done a little bit, like I said, ready to the duty to serve, but uh, not as much on this. Uh, but uh, yeah, I know that's especially a big. And our our small banks able to sell them as well and stuff. And uh, yeah, so I, I I don't have an a, a quick answer for you, but yes, I think that's interesting, and that's definitely something that 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 we can look at, and we've. And I, th I think it's a high per percentage, though, yes, for sold, for all lenders and all size lenders in rural areas and not. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Um, the next question is, how can you find out when banks have their CRA requirements due? Well, there, you can find out about the exam if you, again, you can go to, uh, you can go to the FFIEC and you can find out about the exam in a link, or you can go directly to like the Office of Comptroller or Currency or the FDIC website. And there's normally, it's an interesting process, and I think there was an excellent paper here written a long time ago about it. And it, it there's comments uh, whenever, you know, they'll notify you about a quarter ahead of time before there's gonna be an evaluation, and then you can make comments, I think if I'm getting, understanding it right, you can make comments on the CRA if you think maybe a lender's not fulfilling or maybe you think they're doing a great job. You can make comments and actually you can do it through the website, I know, uh, and you can uh, uh, you can be involved in it that way. And it's it's a, it, it's important too that you are involved in the process and are aware of this because that's the only way the CRA will work is if you're aware of it and you do comment and you do know this information because then, you know, that, that might be beneficial to you and it also might help a lender. Uh, a lender maybe uh, maybe could earn CRA credit or points if they did your help to, you know provided some kind of assistance in your project and uh, knowing about that so yes you can find out about it and normally or you could go straight if you know the OCC or the FDIC was performing the evaluation you could go there uh, or you could go to the FFIEC website all right thank you so the next question is um, does one evaluator perform most of the CRA examinations? Yes, the uh, FDIC performs about two-thirds of the evaluations. And this is interesting because there used to be four, four evaluators. There used to be the OTS, the Off Office of uh, Thrift and S Savings, and then the OCC and the Federal Reserve and the FDIC. But now the OCC has essentially taken over for the OTS. But the, 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 F the FDIC does about two-thirds of them. Uh, and I think uh, the uh, the OCC does another, the other maybe 20% or so, and then the Federal Reserve does some as well. But yes, the FDIC does most of them. Okay, next question um, is coming in that says, what determines a bank's regulator? A uh, lender's regulator is basically determined by the, where they're chartered. Um, whether they're like national or state chartered, uh, I think, um, and so essentially, and also the regulator who the regulator who does all the oversight, the federal oversight, is the one who essentially will perform the CRA exam for a lender. So if the lender won't, if it's under the FDIC's auspice, it'll be doing this. The, that is the regulator that'll be administering the CRA for them. But it's based on their charter, and I think it's national charters, the OCC, uh, and the other the other is split up between the FDIC and the Federal Reserve. Uh, so, but it's based on where you're chartered, is whose who's authority you're under, and who does all your regulatory stuff, essentially your federal regulatory stuff, they will perform your CRA exam. Okay, um, next question. Will the efforts you discuss to include CRA-related activities in rural areas include improvements to the implementation of the CRA? Well, I, I hope I get to, I think there's there's been an effort to see if there's any way to increase rural uh, rural activity uh, related to the CRA. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, th I think the OCC is particular has talked about this, about efforts, how can we expand activity? And there's been, I think, some efforts to increase what would be eligible to receive CRA credits. So maybe it wouldn't necessarily be in your assessment area, but it would be kind of in an area you would serve to increase rural coverage. So um, I don't know how that's actually proceeding because there's, there's a, a big issue is if you, the CRA is heavily dependent on bricks and mortar location of offices and so, and, and like branch offices. And so that maybe might limit. So that's, 
the assessment area might be limited by that. And so there's been, and, and that'll have to be dealt with. That's a, also a future issue too, as we have fewer bank branches and closings of bank branches and there's more electronic and people are using phones. Uh, that'll change a lot. And so uh, that'll be a whole new area and I don't know how the, the regulation will adapt to that. Uh, but but uh, yes, I, I, I don't know at the, the present time whether there's been any implementation. I don't think there has been any changes right now. I, I mean, uh, but, but it will be interesting. And I find that fascinating, actually. In the future, well, how will that work since it's based on bricks and mortar location? And actually, the number of bank branches has declined for a couple years now. And especially in rural areas, a lot of times, that's a whole other issue. And so how will that affect the CRA since it's based largely on the location of those, the assessment areas? And the assessment areas where a bank's evaluated. So that really is important. All right, so we've just got two additional questions. Um, the first is, has HAC looked at CRA exam um, limited scope versus full scope, the reviews, especially for large banks? Um, this, the, the person says they think you'll find that rural areas get only limited scope reviews, thus have less influence in the exam process. Yes, we have not looked at that, but we have heard that too. That that uh, that, that whenever they the the exam focuses on an area that it's limited amount of rural focus, and uh, we have not looked into that. But yes, we've heard of that. Like as opposed to looking at everything when they focus in on a particular area that they may uh, be limited amount of rural areas. And and yeah, no, we we would like to look into that actually uh, because this is this project's going further. It's it's grown from just a basically with this is just a our first part was describing the CRAs because there wasn't much even people even really talked about CRA in rural area and then we, we started to focus on as in the next couple uh, webinars examples of where the CRA was used in rural areas and yeah we'd like to expand it to include that to the analysis uh, yes I think that's an important point that uh, that the focus of the value the exam if it's not uh, if it ex excludes most rural areas it could be you know that could greatly limit it. All right, Keith, and so this last question, well, actually, there's another question coming in, but this question here kind of feeds back into that one. It says, um, does the CRA examination specifically look at the lender's assessment area? Uh, yes, it, I mean, the, the exam is only going to look at their assessment area, but then within that, they do tend to focus on a particular area, but yes, the, in general, yes, the CRA, like if, if a bank doesn't delineate a certain community as it overall as its assessment area, it wouldn't look at it. So it's only based on their service area. So yes, it, it wouldn't, if, if, uh, if you went and looked at a bank's assessment area and you were outside of that assessment area, they would not evaluate. That wouldn't be taken into consideration. Yes. All right. Um, the next question is, has HAC looked at what percentage of large banks um, that are based on their usage of the 502 guaranteed loan program. Most of these loans are made by very large banks such as Wells Fargo. Uh, no, uh, no, no, we haven't particularly looked at, at any particular uh, uh, loan. Uh, we've looked a little bit at uh, the, the, like the amount of loans and the size of the lender to see if there was any variation as it relates to the CRA but we haven't looked at uh, particular 502 loans or any kind of loans, no. Um, uh, so we've done, in that report I, I referenced there, we looked a little bit more at the lending activity as it related to the lenders, but not, not specifically in that form, no, no. Okay, and so that was the last question. Just want to give maybe a couple more seconds, Keith, just in case some folks have burning questions that they're typing in right now. So going once, going twice, <laughs> uh, let's see, just another few seconds. I don't want to rush anyone off the phone or off the lines before we're able to take the last question. All right, seeing no questions being entered in the Q&A box, I just want to do a quick reminder before we wrap up just to let everyone know that both the uh, recording and PowerPoint that includes all the maps and stuff will be available on HACS website following the broadcast. Also, please be on the lookout for an email um, following the webinar which contains a link to your certificate of participation as well as a brief survey. This survey lets HACS know how we're doing in delivering 
um, information most relevant to your activities. And so if you could please um, complete that survey. So before we close out, I want to offer Lance and Keith both the opportunity to make any final closing remarks. I think we're fine. It just uh, just reiterate. I think that uh, the CRA. I, I hope there there is an increased focus on it in rural areas. I think it has the there's the potential there uh, for uh, you know uh, more involvement with people with the CRA and maybe and it helps stir more more development in, in uh, rural areas. It's greatly needed. Um, so I just think that a little more focus on it can, is good. And uh, and but that that that's it. I just think it's a it's a be a fruitful exercise. Thank you, John Terry, and this is Lance, and I would just like to um, <clears throat> really thank everyone for joining us in this discussion today and helping us out in this process. Um, we really value your feedback um, throughout this process and especially going forward um, after the presentation. I would also reiterate for you to or suggest that many of the participants also download and access the report. There's more detailed information. We gave a brief overview. And I'd really like to compliment Keith and the entire research team at Hack on this product or on this on this work. In many respects, this is uncharted territory. Um, there's not a lot of information about that, and he's gone through massive amounts of data analysis and and assessments and and, and a large um, it was a large effort so we really appreciate um, Keith's uh, work on this and we also invite again you to um, participate in the upcoming discussions where we might drill down a little deeper into this topic and certain elements of the topic so with that again we thank you for your participation um, and we look forward to um, continuing this discussion with you thank you Terry all right having See no additional questions in the Q&A box. I'd like to thank both Keith and Lance for the wealth of information provided during today's webinar. Also want to thank each and every one of you for joining us for today's webinar and wish you a very uh, well rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Have a good day.